Welcome to Fright Fix. My name's Sook. And my name's Celia. How are you doing this week, Sook? I'm good. I'm very good. I've had too much for dinner. But besides <laughs> that, I'm ready to get through this episode. How are you doing, Celia? Yeah, I mean, I'm slightly daunted by the amount that I think we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> I mean, this film, we've got so much to go through. So oh, I'm, I, I think it's going to be a good one. I think uh, I think we'll get a lot out of this. Yeah, it's, it's, this uh, will definitely be a substantial episode, at least in comparison to our previous ones. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So, as usual, every month, we delve into the twisted world behind the screen of your favourite horror films. You can find Fright Fix anywhere that you listen to podcasts, and you can follow us on social media at Fright Fix Podcast. So this week, we watched the 1980 film, The Shining, an adaptation of the Stephen King novel of the same name. So this film stars Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance, Shirley Duvall as Wendy Torrance, and Danny Lloyd as Danny Torrance. And it's directed by the legendary Stanley Kubrick. I love that two of the main characters have the same name as the actors. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Jack and Jack, Danny and Danny. I love that. So I'll give my usual spoiler warning that we will be discussing the film all the way to the end. So if you haven't seen it, go and watch it and come back to our podcast later. We will be waiting. So to jog your memory, the film's central character is Jack Torrance, an aspiring writer and a recovering alcoholic who accepts a position as the off-season caretaker of the isolated Overlook Hotel. Jack brings his wife, Wendy, and his young son, Danny. Danny is gifted with The Shining, a psychic ability that enables him to see into the hotel's horrific past. After a winter storm leaves the family stuck at the hotel with little communication to the outside world, Jack's sanity deteriorates due to the influence of the supernatural forces that inhabit the hotel, placing his wife and son in danger. Da, da, da. So what, did, what were your overall thoughts of this film? Now, this is like the second or third time I've seen this film. Yeah. So overall thoughts, I mean, the opening's great, you know, sweeping landscapes, puts you in the mood, you know, gets, gets you feeling that isolation, that being mm -hmm. far from civilization. You know, the film's full of quite a lot of iconic imagery, like yeah. the blood coming out of the elevator and, you know, the scary little twin girls. Mm. And, uh, you know, that sharp Jack looking out the window where the camera lingers on him and he's looking all deranged. <laughs> and uh, but I don't know, despite the, 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 the outstanding visuals for the time, for me, the entire film just feels a little bit empty and kind of left me feeling a bit deflated even though I'd seen it before, I mean, I mean, it doesn't take away from the fact that I think I, I found that I noticed more this time around that now than I ever did before. But I don't know. To me, it just felt like a, a wonderful rack of ribs or something. But when you kind of bite into it and chew it, it you know, it's, it's a bit stale. It, yeah, just a bit kind of chewy and a bit bland and flavorless. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what, 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 Celia, what did you think of the film? Well, I mean, I kind of thought you would say that because I have a feeling that you you want you would have wanted a little bit more of that kind of exploration of the supernatural and you know really going into it, and it does kind of leave you wanting a lot more. And I definitely thought that as well. I think the film is a physical experience. Like you leave it a bit battered and bruised by all that the noise. <laughs> that sound. You know, you're like. <laughs> I was, I was thinking to myself, you know, if I had to listen to this music, this soundtrack, I would probably go a bit mad as well. So I think there's all this intense imagery and it's, you know, it's it's got the elements of a classical, you know, psychological thriller. Yes. And like you said, some of the shots are so iconic that it feels like you're in the history of horror films. You know, there's so much being played on The Shining, all you know, the, the carpet and like you said, the twins and the blood and everything. I yeah. mean, you can't get away from how iconic the film is. Definitely. But as the film itself, and maybe more of the storyline of the film, it was, it did leave me wanting more. But I do think that everybody should see this film, even if you're not a horror fan, just for the kind yes. of cinematography and the acting. I think it's a great piece of uh, a moment in time where you can see people acting to their absolute you know, <laughs> best of their abilities. They were not, they were giving their all, you have to admit. Um, and so for that angle, I think this film is really good. 
you know what you touched upon something where it, i was just gonna ask you actually what did you think of the acting and the uh the casting choices for the movie so this is an interesting one and i wonder what you think i can't fault jack nicholson i think he's a brilliant actor and he was perfect for the role in this film i would have liked to see more of a descent into madness because that's what right. happens in the book he goes from this guy who would never possibly do anything to you know he's got his he's got his demons but you know, at the beginning where the manager kind of over explains the problems of the hotel and says, well, the last caretaker killed his family. You won't do anything like that, will you? And, and he's like, that he's sounds like, perfect. Yeah, exactly. He already seems a little bit unhinged when he's talking to him. He's like, that's not going to happen to me. You know, and he's kind of smiling and it just it, it feels like you you kind of know what's going to happen. Yeah. So. He's already got this sarcastic kind of smile and he's yeah. a bit ominous. Oh, yeah. So I would have liked to have seen that. And I'm not a fan of the representation of Wendy in this right. film. Right. I think Shelley Duvall did an amazing job at yeah. what she was given. Mm-hmm. Wendy in the book is, is much more fearless. And I do understand Kubrick's choice to make Wendy really desperate because you feel that desperation mm. all the way through and how helpless and scared she is. But I did get a little bit annoyed at how much <laughs> crying there was. <laughs> I think I said the opposite in the Woman in Black episode because I thought he needed to be more scared. And I think in this one, oh, yeah. I think Wendy needs to be a little bit less scared. Um, but overall I think that's kind of the one area of the film that I would have liked to see a little bit more is that character development that that wasn't quite there but but the acting skills for the the job that they were given they were brilliant yeah yeah what do you think do you do you agree or do you think something different well I I actually uh, agree with most of what you said I mean Jack Nicholson cast as Jack Torrance I thought I thought I just can't can't think of anyone else playing that role, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean he's just a nutcase in, mm-hmm. in this movie. And uh, uh, funny enough, I have the opposite opinion with Shelley Duvall's character because right. uh, I've, I've I mean f- full disclosure I've not read the book so I, I can't compare it to anything. And I'm sure I mean generally with movies they tend to disappoint anyone that's read the book. I mean that's just very rare. Does it ever? you know, work the other way around. But Shelley Duvall, you know, she plays this kind of timid, tortured, biddable wife perfectly. Um, I mean, if that, I mean, if that's what the intention of the the movie was, then she, she, you know, hits out of the park. And her transformation from gentle to terrified and protective of her kid. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, that in itself, I, I felt was, was quite phenomenal. Mm. And uh, I loved, uh, you know, Scatman Crothers' character. I forget his name's at Holloran or something. Which one? Uh, the, uh, the 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 chef character. Oh, the chef. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like uh, I wanted him as my friend. <laughs> he just seemed yeah. so happy and upbeat. I was like, be my friend. So. Oh, I know. Yeah, and the and the, and the Danny, you know, he's a kid. I mean, kids very rarely kind of, uh, you know, nail their parts. But I think generally in this movie. He, uh, I think he was amazing. And just uh, seeing him point his little finger and talk to Tony and do that kind of like, red ram, no. Yeah, and he's a little child. As well. Yeah, that's really impressive, isn't it? I think, yeah, the acting is incredible. And I think it's one of those films that leave you thinking that that has taken a toll on them. You know, yes. you can see that they worked really hard. Yeah, in those and, cons- and considering it's the like the two of them for the majority of the movie, that's it's uh, it's impressive, mega impressive. I mean, uh, like I'd mentioned with um, with Greta, like this could have easily been written as a um, as a stage play or something. Yeah. It's just like, um, yeah, I thought it was great. Uh, I mean, did you um, have a favorite scene, or or if you did, I mean, what was your favorite scene? I'm quite uh, quite interested to <laughs> see what your opinion is on this. Well. I mean, it was hard to think of a favourite scene because there were so many that's, um, that from an entertainment point of view and from a just iconic point of view, you could choose the blood coming out of the, the doors. I mean, there's nothing quite like that. But no. I think it was less of a scene that was my favourite thing, more of a stylistic choice okay. for the device. So I love the way that the audience is supposed to keep track of the days that go by with those pop-ups, you know, one month later, mm-hmm. one week later, and then it's Monday and then it's a time and it yes. keeps, these keep popping up. But what I loved about that was that 
they didn't actually mean anything. Like apart from the one month later, which actually yeah. showed that they'd been there for a while, yeah. telling us that it was Monday and then telling us that it was Wednesday, it, it didn't actually do anything. The time yeah. <laughs> all kind of flowed together. And I think it highlighted the isolation that the family were feeling because the days all blend together and mm. it has no meaning. It doesn't matter if it was a Wednesday or it was a weekend. And I just thought that was really, really clever. And it really kind of abruptly changed all those scenes. Um, and I, yeah, that was something that I really, really liked about it. What about uh, you? Uh, yeah, no, you just made me think of uh, think of that in a different way now. But I mean, yeah, I think what you've just said might have influenced one of my later on points now. But Ooh. yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, my favourite scene for me at the whole thing, there was one standout and that was the when Wendy's climbing backwards up the stairs and she's holding the bat and uh when you know jack is like walking up to her and saying you know i'm just gonna bash your brains in or whatever know. you know well, what does he say he's like i'm not gonna hurt you i'm just gonna bash your brains in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 something like that like that that whole scene i i mean uh, yeah I, even the the you know when i watched it before that was the one scene where i kind of woke up a little bit in the movie and uh just her suffering her helplessness oh yeah. my god her just it it's like she'd cried so much she just didn't have any tears left for system yeah. she was so yeah. weak and like the way she was holding the knife she just uh, like she had no energy to even run no um, she was just like flailing it around weakly as well like uh oh, i don't know i mean yeah that that by far is my favorite scene i think um another there's a little clip which i thought was quite impressive which kind of like jumped out at me in the movie was you know the bit where he's uh, using the axe on the door? Hmm. And uh, there's a thing where it kind of follows the axe as he's yeah. like, you know, swinging it back and forth. The camera like focuses on the axe. And I don't know if that's some kind of like pan scan trick or something. I can't imagine that was captured raw in camera. I think they've done something in post to, to get that. But I thought that was just such a dynamic shot. Like, yeah. I, you know, it's the, every, every, pretty much everything in the movie is just a camera just plonked in one air, one place and it's just yeah. like a static shot. But that was like, yeah, I thought that was pretty, pretty cool how it emphasized the, the axe. Yeah, it kind of made it more intense, didn't it? Because a lot of the shots are long and drawn out, whereas this one with the movement made everything kind of speed up a little bit and it, yes. it heightens you. You're, you're listening to Shelley Duvall's screams, you're watching him with the axe and you're also being moved by the camera quite a lot. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why we all feel a bit battered after the <laughs> after the film. You think I've gone through so much. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a it's definitely an experience. <laughs> so was there anything you didn't like about the shining? Oh dear. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I didn't like the music and the film. Mm. I didn't mind all that kind of high-pitched violin sound or whatever, that kind of screeching music. But just even at the beginning with that kind of like bow, 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 whatever that music is. And uh, I thought it was just a little cheapo and, um, mm. but not charming cheap, like how early John Carpenter music was. I mean, you could tell he made the, probably made an entire soundtrack just on one synthesizer or whatever, but it just, yeah, this it just, I don't know. I, I just found the soundtrack a bit cheap and um just touching upon what you mentioned about Jack, uh, Jack's character earlier on, what you mentioned, um, I mean, he seemed pretty selfish and shifty to begin with, as you mm. mentioned. And I didn't like how he spoke on behalf of his wife and kids when uh, when he was talking to the manager and he was like, they'll love it. You know, they are they going to love being here? Blah, blah. Mm. I don't know. He just generally, from the beginning, just seemed like a jerk uh, yeah. from the get-go. And, and it was like when they showed that kind of one month later, slide i don't know it just felt, didn't feel like much changed and um but just generally across the whole movie i mean obviously besides him turning into from a jerk to a possessed psycho yeah there wasn't really much in the way of character transformation or much of a yeah. journey for his character because and i was just thinking like yes yeah, so when that one month slide came up I was like, at which point did jack go crazy in the film because yeah. there was no transition to it and it's no. not like he started off as particularly likable. Like, like he, it's not like he was like this kind of charming Paul Rudd type and yeah. then turned into crazy Jack Nicholson. It was just, I don't it was know. always that way. I, that's, that's what I mean. It's like, I wanted, I wanted to have left the film saying, how did it end up that way? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What possibly is in that hotel that changed him so much? And I think he could have been a flawed character, you know, 
uh, an alcoholic uh, fa- kind of failing writer and had his his demons but that doesn't make you an inherently bad person to start yes. with but they did show him as like you said there were small bits which showed you as I mean I wasn't surprised that he was the one that then kind of turned out to be the axe wielding maniac um, yeah yeah just having that progression and, and seeing how the hotel changed him mm. rather than yeah you know, like you said he it, it was already there and maybe yeah. that was a choice but I agree it wasn't yeah easy. and it wasn't particularly clear to me like what set him off like I know he meets the the the, the butler or whatever Grady or I forget what yeah. character he but so the so the, the guy had previously done all the murders in the hotel he, he meets him Delbert Grady I think yeah yeah and he tells him that oh Danny's bringing in an outsider to break up their situation or something and uh but I didn't see like what pushed Jack over the edge to, to yeah. become that psycho and like and what um like tied Jack specifically to the hotel it was just wasn't so clear to me I'm, yeah I'm sure there was something there I just feel like I mean normally things don't go over my head when it when it comes to movies I very rarely meet a, meet a movie like mm-hmm. encounter a movie where I feel like it's way too intelligent for me but I just feel like it, this in this film it just wasn't super obvious and um and I was thinking like uh you know um a part of me was thinking towards the beginning of the film I tried to watch it like as if I'd never watched it before and I was thinking like how much of all this stuff is just in the characters heads and how much of it is it like is it real like is it a real monster or ghost or whatever and then the bit where I felt like oh okay these are real ghosts or whatever monsters or whatever in, in the film is you know when Jack is locked in the fridge yeah and it doesn't show who lets him out like we don't we all we hear is the sound of the fridge open Mm. so clearly someone's opened it and I can only assume it was it wouldn't have been Danny and it wouldn't have been Wendy it must have been a miracle happens that means that there must be something there as well yeah because at first I was in doubt a little bit because when Wendy comes screaming to him and says oh there's a lady in the hotel Mm. and she's hurt uh, Danny like because you don't and then she says, oh, Danny told me. And I was thinking, okay, yeah. so she hasn't physically seen it. Seen anything, yeah. But then, yeah. I suppose it's supposed to play with your mind a little bit, isn't it? Is it real? Is it not? Until you get that that physicality at the end. I suppose you're, you're left wondering what the hotel is and what it does to those characters. And maybe the ambiguity was part of it. Maybe we're supposed to be want, wanting more and that we can never understand this overlook hotel is that's the only thing i can think of is that yeah it's supposed to make you feel a little bit mad as well because you can't really put your finger on what's going on right, maybe it's right. more of an like an audience experience i don't know i'm yeah. just thinking about that now as you're and, speaking because i felt the same kind of goes yeah there, and i didn't understand the whole 1921 overlook thing at the end that that picture i don't know if that ties into what you were going to discuss later on or anything but did you have any feelings or thoughts on that i felt like it was just kubrick trying to mess with us i feel like he just wants to put something in the end to make everyone think what (laughs) (laughs) what i I did feel the same i was wondering but i thought maybe there's some deeper meaning that i just didn't understand or something like the only the only two things i could think about was one that he just become part of the hotel and that everybody in that photo in some way is part of the hotel now kind of you know that that mm. side and then the other one was very loose but i don't i don't know if this is true but the way he's standing he's got one yeah. arm up and one arm down um is like the devil on a tarot card oh. so i didn't know whether he was supposed to be representing the devil maybe or i don't know is that the standard position of the devil on tarot card yeah it's like a dance he's like dancing and jumping up I, I don't read tarot yeah. but I think I saw it somewhere where they were kind of jumping uh, up, the, up like that and that's how he's standing um those are the only two things I can think of but I do think it was just putting there to mess with us <laughs> was there was there anything that you didn't like about the film I mean we've kind of covered it already because mine was about the character's descent and mm. I really wanted to see more of that one thing that bugged me and will Go continue on. to bug me <laughs> until you can prove otherwise <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, when the manager is telling Jack about the caretaker and his family, mm-hmm. he says, this is so trivial and it's, it shouldn't bug me so much, but it does. Go on. <laughs> he says that he killed his two daughters. One was aged eight and one was aged 10. So why are they twins in the film? And why have they always been told that, that they're ghost twins, the twin girl? Right. 
They're right. not twins. I think they're right. supposed to be twins. That is very interesting you say that, because this is something I'd never thought of before or noticed before. But when I was watching the film today, yeah, uh, like the girls didn't look the same to me. One looked older than the other. Ah, so maybe the, it's not the film's fault. It's just everybody's fault, everybody else's fault. That they but are. but they could be twins. But I did notice that I was like, wait a minute, they don't look like twins. I thought maybe it was a dodgy camera angle or something. Yeah. Well, like, I was hyper aware of it because I I heard him say one was age eight and one was age ten, and I always remembered them as twins. And when I googled it, they always come up as the shining twins. But yeah. I did the same thing when I was watching it. I was like, they don't look the same. They're dressed the same, but they don't look the same. So was it just an audience misunderstanding because think, they're dressed the same? I think you might be right. I think you've noticed something. I think I think I think they, they their intention was probably to make them look like twins, and you've just picked up on an error. Oh, I feel so good. I feel yeah. like I've been justified in my annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm backing you on that. Every time somebody talks about the twins now, I'm like, um, they're not actually twins. They're sisters. <laughs> <laughs> So, Celia, what have you decided to focus on the theme for this episode? So this episode, I was really interested in the way that The Shining explores complex and dysfunctional family dynamics. There are some obvious scenes of dysfunction, like, you know, Jack shouts at his wife all the time. He taunts her, he belittles her. Um, But I do think that there are some subtle ways that the film shows the characters as kind of the antithesis of the perfect family which were really interesting, that weren't just about their kind of volatile relationship. Some people have said that the film represents the decay of the perfect American family. You know, they go they go to this, ho- ho- this hotel and everything just breaks down. But I think they've always been broken. They never seemed like a family unit to start with. Uh-huh. Um, and I just think that isolation of the hotel magnified it rather than created a new problem. Um, so the one initial way that we can see this is that you rarely ever see the three of them together, even before they go to the hotel. But while they're in the hotel, they never sit down for a meal. They never play games together. There's never this moment of, you know, domestic bliss or anything like that. They're yeah. often in really different parts of the hotel. And it it kind of, it's highlighted through the fact that the different rooms in the hotel look really differently as well. So they could be anywhere. Like one room is the ballroom. Run, one room's a boiler room. One room's got crazy geomet- geometric carpets one's green one's orange you know it's a completely different world that they're in and they're never together it, i never noticed that until you just mentioned it yeah even just a, a scene in the early days when they're just sitting around a table would have been normal yeah. Yeah. just normal the only thing when they were driving to the hotel they were together but you don't see them as, as a perfect family, even in that scene. Um, so I just think, yeah, it's a really good way of showing the loneliness of each of the characters and the fact that they don't get support from each other at all. And I think that this broken family is, there's a really good indicator of it through the relationship between the father and the son. So Jack and Danny barely have any exchanges together by themselves. And one of the only ones that they do is when Jack kind of forces Danny to sit on his lap and they have that really intense conversation about the hotel and Danny even asks if Jack is going to hurt him and Wendy there's a really intense scene and when Danny walks in he can see Jack on the bed and the camera shows Jack kind of from behind to the side and then you also see a mirror image of Jack looking straight at the camera and I don't know if you noticed this and it'd be interesting to see if you did but I found that scene really creepy because Jack's face in the mirror has a slight smile but when you look at the real Jack it doesn't look like he's smiling at all didn't pick up on that at all no I, I need had to go, go watch back. that I, I had to, to go back again. and check it and I don't know whether it's I don't know if you've ever seen your own reflection slightly to an angle and you do look really different but mm. it just looks like the one in the mirror is smiling and the one that's actually sitting on the bed isn't and I thought that this was a really good representation of how Danny sees his father because Danny's seeing the one that isn't smiling he's seeing his real father and I I wonder whether that is showing that Danny sees his dad as an ominous figure you know he's he's not he hasn't got any good expression he's almost smirking it was just really creepy and uh, Danny, now you've got like I've got a shivers <laughs> up my spine just listening to that <laughs> 
I mean, I could I could have got it wrong. I could have, maybe they haven't, but uh, it got me, that one. And Danny, he looks so uncomfortable while Jack is hugging him. And it shows that that's not something they regularly do. And then Jack says to Danny, I wish we could stay here forever and ever mm, and ever. And then yeah. that parallels what the ghosts, girls, not twins, say. <laughs> <laughs> When they say, come play with us, Danny, forever and ever and ever. Yeah. And I think that shows that Jack is not a protective or supportive father figure for Danny. He's not there to keep him safe from the ghosts of the hotel. Instead, Danny sees his father as part of what terrifies him. So he gets no comfort from his dad. He can't run to his dad and hug him and say, I'm really scared of these ghosts that I'm Mm. seeing. Because his dad's part of that. And I think that shows that family is broken is broken from that point. Yeah, because he plays with his mother in the snow, but he doesn't play at all with his father, not even with the ball that he's throwing around. Yeah, and I I think it's, it just shows that it's, it's a really sad element of the film that he never has that relationship with his father and he never gets that protection from him. But we see that in a lot of horror films where the father figure does take control and tries to save the family from whatever the evil is but when the mm. evil is within your own family that's what's really scary i think about this film is is not the ghosts it's that it's the dad um and you don't see that as often i don't think no that's quite interesting i wonder if it's <laughs> some metaphor for just like domestic abuse <laughs> or something yeah. where it's, yeah. there's definitely elements of it absolutely and obviously we can't talk about jack you know we can't not talk about jack taking the axe to the bathroom door when we discuss how broken this family is. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's such a physically impressive scene. Like we were saying earlier, it's raw and horrific. Mm. Um, But I think this horror does come from the sense of this perverted kind of family dynamic. And it's a complete breakdown of the family. Jack says, Wendy, I'm home, you know, Mm. as he axes the door. And it's a great example of the typical American values of the father returning home to the wife (laughs) is just made really menacing. You know, he's using all of these things like the famous, here's Johnny. Um, I'm butchering these lines, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I think I prefer your versions anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Slightly less uh, deranged. Um, So yeah, he says, here's Johnny, which is a line that Jack Nicholson ad-libbed which comes from the Johnny Carson show. Mm. And that was known as a kind of wholesome family program. So again, this line kind of poisons the sitcom values of domestic bliss and the perfect family. And it subverts it into something really horrible. And I think this scene really highlights how Jack is mocking the idea of a perfect family and he's using it to gain control over Wendy by scaring her even more. Yeah, yeah. So what's funny about that line is I don't think, uh, yes, as you mentioned, it was an ad lib line. I, and because Kubrick, I think he lived in England, he didn't, he wasn't familiar with the line. Right. And once he found out that it was from the Johnny Carson show, he very nearly didn't include it in the movie. Mm. And just think how The Shining probably would have been very different without that line. Really different. But mm. then when you watch it without knowing about that, here's Johnny line, it is a bit confusing. Because you're like, why did he just say that? It's, it's one of those Jack. <laughs> yeah. It just, yeah, I think it's another thing where you think, it's just gone completely over my head. I've missed something. <laughs> and But then... I kind of did ha- I was a little bit underwhelmed when I found out what the reason was. I was like, oh, I thought it was going to have more of a deeper meaning than that. <laughs> but maybe I'm asking too much. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Yeah. <laughs> so the last way that the film shows this terrible hierarchy of control that Jack is showing throughout is the use of the maze. And Jack shows his power and control over his family when Wendy and Danny are walking through the hedge maze and Jack is watching them through the model of the maze. And it doesn't quite tell you if he's watching them or if we're just seeing them from bird's eye view and he's looking at the model. But I think you're supposed to think that Jack can see these tiny little figures of his family in this hedge maze as they're right in the middle. And so he can see them, but he, they can't see him. And he has complete control because he's the only one that knows the way out. And then later, when Jack is chasing Danny through the maze, Danny manages to outsmart him by retracing his footsteps in the snow and hiding. And once Danny gets out of the maze, Wendy and Danny leave Jack forever, ending Jack's power over them. And I think this is really symbolic of ending the ending of an abusive father losing control over his family and their ability to survive without him, whereas Jack can't survive without his family. Mm. Yeah, resulting in him freezing to death in a maze. Wow. So it's like his family are escaping that. They're, they're leaving him in the night, like exactly. a, as, a, as, a, as a, 
yeah, they're just taken off and uh, left alone to die. That's kind of, I can't quite shake the the, the comparison to just uh, domestic violence and domestic yeah. abuse now. Wow, you've totally twisted my um, my view on the film. Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many, like I said at the big, beginning of this section, there are so many obvious ways that that Jack is, is horrible to Wendy. But yeah, it's these these more symbolic ways that he shows control or that their relationships are subverted that I think is really impressive about this film. And I think there are so many ways you can view their relationship and the, the and I know we'll go into kind of the theories about it later, but I just thought this was a really interesting one to try and understand who the characters are. And I, I always think if somebody survives at the end of a film, there's a reason why they survive. If it's a film where they could have died, somebody made the choice to allow them to live. Right. And, and that's why I think Danny and Wendy are able to break free because it is this kind of breaking free from this abusive family dynamic. And Jack is ultimately the one who suffers because he's the perpetrator. He's the person who's, you know, who's who's the villain in, in yeah. both the ghost story and in this story of the family. So he's the one that needs to die. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> after getting depressed watching this movie, I suppose, yeah, technically there is a happy ending to some degree. There is a bit of a happy ending. I mean, you never we don't know what happens to Wendy or Danny after they leave. They leave in the snow truck and they go over the I was I was so sure that it was going to break down that snow truck as they were driving away. I was like, please don't. I don't think I can handle anymore. They've mm. gone through so much. I would have just given up at that point. But yeah, there is an almost silver lining, which is they were able to get away. I wonder if you could just edit out all the ghost bits and see if the film still stands as a, as a tale of domestic violence. I reckon it would. I think it would. Because you could take out pretty much, I mean, you'd want to leave in the conversations that Jack has with Lloyd when he talks about the fact that he had, he hints to hurting Danny in, in the past. You keep all of that stuff in, but you could mm. take out all the scenes with the caretaker. You could take out pretty much all the stuff about the shining between, yeah. you know, with Danny and the woman in the bathtub, the blood. I'm, I'm sure you could take out a lot of that and then you would have a very different film about a family who is isolated and it results in their poor family dynamics breaking down into something much more terrifying. Yeah. You know, you, what you, <laughs> something you just made me think about right now is the film's called The Shining, yet not much of it really hinges on The Shining. Yeah, I agree. I remember when I watched this again, I'd forgotten what The Shining was. And I think that's a really big indicator of it. It was not a massive part of this film. So I was like, oh yeah, it was something about the kid and he could do something, but oh, it doesn't really matter. And it never gets used, really. Not really. I mean, it doesn't help them in any way. If The Shining had predicted that, you know, properly that Jack was going to do that, he would. Danny would have just got his mum and left. <laughs> like, mm. it doesn't actually do anything. You're right. I think there's a lot going on in the film and yeah. some elements maybe were left behind. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine, I mean, I've not read the book, but I can imagine a lot of the plot points from the book are probably butchered in this uh, mm. adaptation. They could have just called it The Overlook or something. I don't know, just named it The Hotel because yeah. it's more about a hotel than it is about anything else. Yeah, absolutely. But I think... It, you're right. It's really interesting to look at it on one side as a ghost story and one side on a story about family. And that you could have two very different films. And then you could probably have a third film about The Shining if you wanted. That's just about this boy who has these powers and he has to save his family from something inevitable. Well, the sequel should have been called The Shining because that's more to do with The Shining than The Shining's about The Shining. Uh, do you want to say Shining anymore? <laughs> Wait, <gonna run. laughs> that's true. I've never seen the the sequel. Uh, oh, is it with um you and McGregor, McGregor yeah. as Danny going yeah. back? Yeah, yeah. I I think the sequel. I mean, I don't, don't want to talk too much about the sequel, but I think the sequel makes more sense than the first than than well, The Shining does. Like just as a standalone piece, there's more of a beginning, middle, and end and character yeah. story, like arcs and whatnot. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a great film, but yeah. It's a continuation of this. So it's, it would be interesting, I suppose. Maybe I'll watch it just to, just to see. So I'm really interested to know what kind of conspiracy theories you've been looking at and any production notes and trivia for this film. So should we dive into that bit? There's a theory that The Shining is actually Stanley Kubrick's way of telling the world 
that he helped NASA fake the moon landings way back in 1969, mm. which would have been uh, 11 years prior to The Shining's release. So <laughs> the story goes that NASA, so during the 60s, they were way behind Russia, especially mm. when it came to the, the space race, which was the, the big thing back then. And uh, through sheer desperation, uh, NASA recruited Stanley Kubrick to direct a fake moon landing. So you're probably thinking, why Kubrick? Well, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> okay, I have so many questions, but I want to know <laughs> the explanation. Yeah, so, well, he had directed a very, very famous science fiction movie in 1968, so the year before the, the alleged moon landings, and that movie was 2001. A space odyssey. Odyssey, yeah. So up until that point, Kubrick's de- depiction of space was probably the most realistic ever committed mm. to film, and probably the most visually impressive, even to this day, to be honest. So I can't imagine which other director would have been good enough to right. fake a moon yeah. landing. <laughs> so here's some evidence that has been proposed by these lunatic fans. <laughs> Evidence is a very strong word for what I think you suggest. <laughs> no, this is, you know what? This is this is scientific fact, yeah. <laughs> I think the I think it's just undeniable evidence. So I'll I'll shoot. So Danny, little Danny's wearing a jumper in the movie, a little knitted jumper. And do you know what was on that jumper? I do, but I want you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Apollo 11 rocket. I subtle, mean, hey? <laughs> that's so subtle. <laughs> Now, here's something that you can confirm or deny. This is not something I could uh, easily find out whether it was true or not. But in the book, the spooky room in the Overlook Hotel is room 217. Yeah. However, Kubrick changed it to 237. Is that a spell? Is that an autocorrect error, a spell check no. error? No. I think not, <laughs> because the distance from the Earth to the moon is 237,000 miles and the room's called 237. That's... Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> so according to um, the fans, uh, the room is supposed to represent the fake lunar landing set mm-hmm. and the Overlook Hotel is supposed to represent America. Wow. And little Danny cycling to the room is uh, supposed to represent Kubrick's artistic side. Mm. I'm not quite sure how that works, but anyway. So let me get this straight. So Kubrick, in this theory, Kubrick faked the moon landing with NASA. Yep. And then instead of keeping it a secret of national security, mm-hmm. he then puts it in his next biggest film with instead of keeping it, would well, the CIA just say no? Well, 11 years would have passed and maybe he just... You know, and there's like, you know, it's like one of the biggest events in history. Maybe he just couldn't Contain live it. with himself. Yeah. And he just had to get it out and, you know, tell the world about it in his own special way. In his own way. The the line in the, uh, what's written on the, on um, on Jack Torrance's uh, uh, typewriter is uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Mm-hmm. So the word all can also be interpreted as A11, okay. which is short for Apollo 11 oh. and the scene where Wendy confronts Jack on the stairs is and he you know Jack's talking about his obligations and mm. his contract to his employer oh. is actually Kubrick when his wife confronted him about the hoax moon landing oh yeah oh. I don't know if that's in the original book or not but yeah I, th- I can't remember. I mean, yeah, I could see that. But I still couldn't get over the fact that I'm sure he would have got either assassinated or <laughs> put away. <laughs> I think if he got assassinated, it probably would have a- a- added fuel oh, to yeah, that. Oh, yeah, true. Or at least, you know, paid off, maybe. Well, maybe he didn't need money. I'm just thinking that the American government can't be very happy with him if he, if he really did. No, and because some... people picked up on it as well. They would have been so annoyed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, something that I, I actually didn't write in my notes, but I kind of vaguely recall is uh, Kubrick shot this movie called Barry Lyndon, and right. I think it might have been for Barry Lyndon. So I think most of the movie was shot using natural light, I think. And there's some scenes where it's just like candles that are illuminating the scenes. I might be totally butchering this, but and I think in order for a camera to capture that minimal amount of light, you need a camera with a massive kind of aperture. Right. 
and a company or organization that had lenses with like below f1 apertures mm. that that actually lent Kubrick the lenses for the, for Barry Lyndon was NASA oh really oh so he does have connections maybe maybe <laughs> maybe so yeah and the I you know you, you'd mentioned uh previously but the i the iconic hexagonal carpet design is mm. supposed to have been uh, based on the Apollo 11 launch pad oh like oh, really? so if you look at the Apollo 11 launch pad from from bird's eye view apparently the shape is supposed to be shape. similar uh, yeah similar but all the same yeah, it's, a, it's a bit of a quinky dink so maybe <laughs> i feel like so, when you take all of these things together really does it does add up but maybe maybe i mean the uh, the twin girls meant to be uh, excuse me? the t- the two girls that happen to look alike <laughs> are, are meant to be ge- a representative of gemini and uh the nasa mission prior to apollo was gemini mm. and uh there were seven apollo space missions but only six of them landed and in the hotel lobby <laughs> there are six crates of seven up oh my god <laughs> now this is I'm, this is the hard facts <laughs> I, I just I'm so, I, I wish I could. I think if you're looking for something, you will find it. And I think that's a perfect example this, of this, look for something. No, 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 no. You're, you're in denial now. Okay? <laughs> There's too many, maybe one or two, but having like this infinite number of facts back up this theory. Infinite is a stretch, <laughs> much like this theory. I'm sorry, I'm not... <laughs> I am completely open to all theories, but this one, I can't. Oh, there's I more. I, oh, <laughs> I think because I don't think the moon landing was fake. I think that's why it doesn't work for me, because then none of this makes sense, because there's absolutely no point, you know? But carry on. <laughs> I mean, uh, so uh, Dick Holleran, uh, the chef guy, he comes up from Florida halfway through the film, which is where Apollo 11 launched from. Of course. And uh, the owner of the hotel has an ego, uh, an ego, an eagle on his windowsill. And do you know what the nickname for the Apollo 11 lunar module was? Was it the eagle? It was the eagle. <laughs> crazy or crazy enough to be true? What do you think? <sighs> crazy. Absolutely crazy, Cirque. <laughs> no, I, c- you, I can't confirm or deny. But what I can say is that it's very easy to find patterns. In things and I think there are definitely like the Apollo 11 shirt I completely get that I also maybe get the numbers of like there was a reason why he chose to change the number mm-hmm. and he clearly knew a lot about space because of um what's it a space odyssey yeah yeah so I get there maybe have been hints but was it hints to that he faked the moon landing or was it hints to his old films was it it could he have just loved space and wanted to add these little things to it because it was something that he'd researched? Because he said that he'd done such a good job with the Space Odyssey that it was the closest thing to real life. So he clearly had a love for it. Lord knows. I mean, I, I can, I can, I can. I mean, I, I, I take it all in good humour with this whole um, conspiracy theory, but it's just. Uh, I, mean, I understand one or two references here and there, but it's, yeah. it's quite amusing that there were like so many references or, or tenuous links to it i think it's incredible what people can pick up i think if you have an idea in your head you can pretty much make anything linked to that you know yeah i think i think where I, where they convinced me was the seven up uh oh, reference sorry. that's where i was like yep it's definitely fact it's, <laughs> it's that it's that what would you yeah. give that conspiracy out of 10 oh man it's by far it. one of the one of the most uh inventive and creative ones and uh clearly fact-based ones i'd give it <laughs> easily 10 out of 10 for effort at least <laughs> for effort what about you <laughs> yes i'll give it a strong four what <laughs> i think there are things in there that i can understand but the seven up is not one of them <laughs> oh lost cause you I'm are sorry. i give up on you i, I know <laughs> i need to be more open-minded clearly <laughs> yeah. we hope you enjoyed this month's fright fix Join us next month as we'll explore a new horror film. We will be posting the movie a few days before the podcast episode is released on our social media. So be sure to follow us at Fright Fix if you want to watch the film ahead of time. If you would like to send us a message or want us to cover a scary movie on an upcoming episode, please feel free to contact us on Instagram or Twitter or email us at podcast at frightfix.com. See you next time.